Well, good morning, everyone. We love the, love the chatter, love the chatter. It's awesome. Well, we're going to get rolling here, and uh, if you would, take out your Staying Connected card, and uh, that's a great way for you to connect. Let us know that you are here. Uh, let us know uh, your information so we can get in contact with you. Uh, so that's a great way to connect. You can also sign in on Facebook, check in, that kind of thing. Let people know where you're at, because uh, this is a good place to be, and we're glad that you're here this morning. Uh, I want to share with you about uh, community prayer. This has been happening for about a month now at the uh, Town Square Community Center. Our uh, superintendent of schools, um, Mr. Rolland Abraham, uh, felt led to, uh, to do this and had been looking for a venue, and it opened up. So between noon and 1 o'clock, uh, we have community prayer, and it's a great time for us to pray for our community our leaders, uh, and that kind of thing. So if you're, uh, it, it's a come and go kind of thing, so, um, but it's a good time. So just want you to be aware of that. Thursday's noon to one at the Town Square Community Room. Today, youth group is headed to Pine Lake. And every time they go to Pine Lake, I get scared. Because uh, 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 in the past, I sometimes would get phone calls. This is what happened. But uh, we're glad that, uh, uh, we're just going to be anticipating that everything's good and, and good time. So. Uh, the last couple of years, it's been good, but there, there were a few years on the front end that uh, we had some mishaps. So anyway, that's today right after church. Uh, so if you're uh, planning to go see Caleb Hines, he'll, he'll help you uh, get all that information um, about that. Next Sunday is um, our Patriotic Week, and so if we're encouraging you to come kind of casual. Uh, we know you might be going somewhere right after church, so uh, feel free to be casual, wear uh, patriotic colors. So... Uh, yeah, red, white, and blue, just you know, be some fun. But uh, So that's next Sunday here uh, at the church. And then uh, July 10th, we'll have Jimmy Dooley here. Uh, you don't know him. He's never been here. He was scheduled to be with us back in 2020. And uh, then COVID happened, and so he never came. So we encourage you to uh, look to come out uh, to see Jimmy on uh, July the 10th. And so that'll be here at the church. And uh, final announcement, uh, this week, kind of a big deal for uh, one of our, uh, our persons. Um, this week, um, Mr. Kent McKissick was honored as the Motor Carrier Inspector of the Year for the state of Indiana. And uh, some people call him Canine Kent. Other people might refer to him as Inspector Gadget, like me. So, uh, uh, but we have a lot of fun. He's a, he's a good guy. But he, uh, he and uh, his wife, Cheryl, they help us in the back every week. Uh, so um, just congratulate him. Uh, but that's a really big deal um, to be honored by the state police as the Motor Carrier Inspector of the Year. All right. Well, we're going to begin our time of worship by reciting the Apostles' Creed. So I encourage us to, to say this together. It's a creed that we affirm, talking about our faith. The word creed means I believe. And uh, maybe you know this, maybe you don't, but the words will be on the screen to help us walk through this this morning. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, the creator of heaven and earth. And in, in, in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived of the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Shall we pray? God, we thank you today for an opportunity to be here in your house to worship you. May you help us today to focus upon you as our author and perfecter of faith. May we remember that you are the one who makes all things possible. And we pray that you will guide us today in our worship. May we hear from you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you'll stand and worship with us, we'll start with Cornerstone. Hope 
thank you so much that we have an opportunity to, to find forgiveness of sin. That because of your son Jesus Christ, the sin and, and the guilt and the shame of our wrongdoing no longer has to be weighing us down. Because you invite us, you invite us to come to the place where we can experience peace with God, where we can experience the help that we so desperately desire and need. So God, here in these moments, may we say thank you. Yes, I, I want to be in that place where I can experience your love and your forgiveness. God, I know that when we come to these moments, when we come to worship, come with a lot of different things uh, that we walk into this space with. And maybe we're watching online and I know there are people today who are walking through some difficult times like people that are, are dealing with pneumonia like Melissa Stover those recovering from surgery like, like Brad Stover and, and Janet Malkey Jay Harris uh, we, we know others who are about to walk into some surgeries this week like Jim Brown so there's concerns. Uh, there are others who are just having some difficult days physically, like, like Mandy Gagenheimer and, and Rita Durbin. Uh, we, we think about those who are, are walking through some of the darkest days of their lives as they are dealing with the fact that a uh, person uh, that's been part of their life is on life support just waiting for their organs to be harvested because they are there's no hope for recovery so we think about that Brad Fritz and his family and, and all that, that means for them we know these are difficult days and we don't understand all that went on but we, 
All we know is that there was an accident and that he will not be with us much longer. So God, we pray. We pray for those who are are going through difficult days that they will turn to you for their comfort, for their strength. God, we think about the Smith family and we think about Danny and God, you know that this family needs your peace and your comfort and your wisdom. And this young lady needs the power of Christ. And the days and weeks ahead. God, we, we pray that as we embark on this journey, as we engage the word of God today, that you'll speak to us. You'll speak to our hearts about who you are. So that this idea that, that God is not some abstract concept, that he's not just someone who lives in lofty places, but that he is real and he's personal and that he sees us right here. God, I pray for each person today, young and old alike, that you will speak because we believe that you are the one who speaks to all generations. We pray these things in the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. And you may be seated. We're going to take up the morning tithes and offerings today and encourage you to give generously. Uh, We're coming to the end of the month, and it's summertime, but I believe that all of us can do our part, and when we do our part, God is glorified. Uh, So uh, for our church will come, we'll take up the morning tithes and offerings. Um, If you're so inclined, you're still looking for giving uh, help when it comes to our um, scholarship giving, so if you'd like to give to that, you can do that as well. Uh, Norm, would you bless our offering this morning?
Good morning. This morning we're going to talk about something really important. We're going to talk about that Jesus is Lord. And I think we hear that a lot, Jesus is Lord, but it's kind of hard to describe. What does that mean? So these guys here are getting ready to go on a trip, right? So they're in their car. Are you guys buckled in? Put your seatbelts on. Colton, put your seatbelt on. <laughs> so they're buckled up. They're ready to go. Do you got your snacks and stuff for the road? Yeah. Anybody got an iPad or a phone? I mean, those are important, right? Oh, no phones. Uh-oh, we're in trouble. Long trip ahead. All right. You guys are missing something. What are you missing? A driver. Why is a driver? Oh, <laughs> we are all in trouble now. <laughs> you be careful. Why? <laughs> Maybe we should talk about why we would not want Murphy to be the driver. Why do we need a driver? Why? I heard it. To drive the car. Who's going to know where to go? Do you guys know how to get to Florida? No? You do? Okay. Do you know how fast you're supposed to go? Do you know how slow you're supposed to go? Do you know what to do when you get to a roundabout? <laughs> do you know what to do when it's blinking caution? No. Do you know what to do if you get pulled over? Cry. <laughs> oh, that sometimes works. So we really need a driver, right? Someone who knows where they're going someone who knows how to handle the caution lights, someone who knows how to handle it when we're in trouble, someone who knows when we have to take a detour or go around the other way. So when we say that Jesus is Lord of our life, he is the driver in our life. He is the one that can get us through those roundabouts, that can get us through those hard times when we've got ourselves in trouble, that can tell us when to slow down or tell us when to speed up and he knows all the directions. He's given us the Bible. So when we say Jesus is Lord, we are saying that Jesus is driving our life. Thank you, guys. We can head to the back now. Well, I got to tell you, I love to hear the sound of children, don't you? I'm glad to have our children here today, and uh, they're going to be learning about Jesus, the Son of God, just like we are here in this moment, here in this space. And um, but you know, kids are funny, right? I think kids are funny. I love kids. Um, you know, I was in the back a few minutes ago, and and uh, we had this little girl over here, and she was kind of checking things out, and. And I started to play peekaboo because, you know, that is like the, the international way of connecting with children, right? Okay, you guys aren't convinced that that's a good way to, to connect with kids. But I can tell you that uh, I'm around kids a lot. We have a, a preschool and daycare, so I'm around kids a lot. And I'll tell you, our babies love when you come in and play peekaboo. You know why? Because... They like it when you react to them. They want to feel like you see them. Did you know that kids like to be seen? They like to know that you acknowledge them, that you are trying to connect with them. They, they might feel like, well, they're not paying attention to me. But when we start to play things like peekaboo, we're attempting to try to connect with them, right? And, and they, if you can connect with them the right way, you get laughter and funny funny expressions, but, you know, maybe you're that scary person and all you do is make them cry. Uh, but um, most of the time, I get those m fun moments with kids, and, and I'll, I'll be, peekaboo, I see you. Or, and, and when I go by the nursery, I might duck below the, below the little Dutch door and uh, poke my head up, and I see you. And, and our kids just think that's hilarious. Um, 
I think they're just making fun of me. Just be honest, just like you are right now. You're, you're trying to be nice, but you're thinking to yourself, dude, he's a little bit weird. But kids really want to know that we see them and we know them and we're trying to connect with them. Well, this little game reminds us that in life, this is a truth. People want to be seen. People want to connect with one another. We want to be seen and known. And God, too, wants us to see him and to be known by him. You see, God wants us to be seen and known because it is through seeing and knowing God that we can be saved from the wrath of God because sin separates us from God. All of us have done wrongdoing, okay? You can, you can be assured that your neighbor has done something wrong. Melissa talked about having a driver. Maybe you, uh, you know, didn't stop at that stop sign. Uh, maybe you uh, were going a little too fast. You know, if you're a race car driver, that's not a bad thing. But, uh, you know, if you're a, uh, you know, there are speed limits, right? So we've all done something wrong. We've all done something wrong. And because of that, sin separates us from God. But God wanted us to be known by the world other than through the law. See, the way that the people would connect with God before he sent Jesus was through the law. They, they had laws. This is how you, if you do these things, you connect with God. If you do this, you know, thou shalt not, right? We have the Ten Commandments, murder, steal, honor your father and mother, you know, these kind of things. These were some, some of the rules. And when we did those things, we would connect with God because it was our way of trying to say, I want to be in relationship with you, so I will do these things. But the law wasn't enough, and God knew that the law wasn't enough, and so he knew that he had to do something more than that for us to be saved. And so what does he do? He sends his son, Jesus, into our world. So I, I want us to talk about the idea that Jesus comes into our world because he's on a mission to save us, to save us from our sin, to save us from ourselves let's be honest sometimes we can get in that downward spiral of making bad choices and we need help to get out of that cycle but I want you to know that John 3 16 talks about this that Jesus Christ is only son our Lord John 3 16 and 17 for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world but to save the world through him the message says this in verse 17 the message is a different translation of, of the scripture and it's John Peterson who tried to make it work for us in our world and he said God didn't come into the world to point the accusing finger how many feel like when we do wrong things we, we have that accusing finger pointing at us God didn't come into our world to condemn us. He, he didn't come to point the accusing finger. In fact, he wanted to save us. That was his goal, was through his son, Jesus Christ, that he would save us. So I, I like what John says in chapter 1, verse 14. This is from the message. The word became flesh and blood and moved into the neighborhood. How many people would like it if Jesus would move into our neighborhood? Number one, we'd have good neighbors, right? I'm not saying you have bad neighbors. I'm just saying that he would be a really good neighbor, okay? But Jesus came and moved into the neighborhood. We saw the glory, the glory of God with our own eyes, the one-of-a-kind glory, like father, like son, like son, like father, generous inside and out, true from start to finish. So we have this understanding of, of God who, who sends his son to move into the world in which we live because he knew that we needed help we needed some way of connecting with God and he knew that the law wasn't enough so he needed to send the one person who could make a real difference he also knew that we needed some way of connecting with God because God was someone that we could not see God who we could not touch we had no way of connecting with God except that we, believe, we had to believe in him. We had to trust in something we could not see. But now this abstract God becomes real in the sense that Jesus moves into our neighborhood. He becomes flesh and blood like us. And he begins to experience life like us. 
Anyone ever have suffering in your life? Jesus experienced suffering. Anyone ever have a joy in your life? Jesus experienced joy. Anyone have conflict with others? Let me just tell you, there's this group called the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes. Jesus had lots of conflict with them. You can read about it. And not only did they have conflict, there was so much conflict that they even chose to send him to a cross to be crucified. And utilize the government to, to accomplish that goal. The real deal is that God wanted us to connect with him. He wanted us to know him and, and have a relationship with us. From the very beginning of creation, we looked at God the Father, the maker of heaven and earth last week. And we talked about the fact that God created humanity, humans, in his image and in his likeness. Male and female were created. And we talked about the fact that the, the two different genders really represent the, the spectrum of how unique God is. Aren't you glad that God is very unique? And he understands us. Now we talked about the fact that sometimes spouses don't get each other. Like, I don't understand her. She doesn't understand me. He doesn't know what I'm talking about. Whatever, right? But God gets it all. He gets it. He doesn't need translation. He doesn't need a little, a little help. He already understands it all. Even when things are left out, he understands. And he wants to connect with us so that we, too, can navigate this world with understanding and wisdom that goes beyond our own cognitive abilities. You know, the fall changed the type of relationship we could have with God here on earth. But I want you to know that it did not stop God from sending his son Jesus into our world. God, being unable to make himself known, contrived to make himself born. It was to a human that Jesus was born. We, we look at the fact that Jesus was born of this person we refer to as the Virgin Mary. She was a young lady who had not had relations with others, with another man, who her conception happened through the Holy Spirit. This young woman was a pure and righteous, favored by God kind of a young lady who was given this task to be the God-bearer. She became the vehicle for which God would enter into our world as a baby. And yes, Jesus had to have his diaper changed just like you and I. He would grow and be nurtured in a world that was looking for God in different packaging. See, he had been this promised Messiah, this, this one that was the people of Israel were told would come and deliver his people. They might have been looking for a political kind of entity. But the kind of entity that God was sending to us was one who wanted to redeem us from, from ourselves, redeem us from sin that separates us from, from God because relationship was what really mattered. The promised one would come and, and at the sound of his voice, nations would be defeated. Yet it's into this world that this little baby comes. To ordinary parents, in some ways, they were average socio they they're people of average socioeconomic status but to this family he arrives he is greeted by people from from all walks of life we have the lowly shepherds who represent kind of the outcast of the community because they weren't well trusted as well as the magi who were wealthy and learned For some, they came bearing nothing but their own praise and worship, and others came bearing extravagant gifts. You know, his earthly father, Joseph, was a guy who was a carpenter. He built stuff with his hands. It's a world of lumber and, and nails that Jesus is first acquaint, acquainted. It is to this world that God becomes, or Jesus becomes God. In our world. 
It's Jesus who shows up in a time when the political scene had experienced peace and economic growth. We call this, this period now the Pax Romana, the peace of Rome. He explains uh, to, the, to the people around him that he has come to fulfill the law, not to overthrow it. However, the goal has become a little bit blurry. Should I do this? And he says, you know, sometimes we get so caught up in doing what we think is right that we forget why we're doing it. And the why is important, and I'm here to clarify the why. I become the why. Relationship, redemption becomes the why. He says, I've come into this re- arena to set the record straight that love, grace, and repentance are the way to God. Only through the Son, of Je- the Son that this is possible. Through Jesus, it's the only way. You know, there were groups that felt threatened. Remember, I talked about those who Jesus had conflict with, the Pharisees and Sadducees, chief priests, these religious leaders. They didn't like him because he was changing up the paradigm. They felt threatened because it meant that they might not be the ones in charge anymore. And they didn't like that. And so, so they utilized people like Pontius Pilate, the governor of Judea and Samaria. It's here that Jesus stands condemned of crimes he had not committed. They created trumped-up charges to allow the government to crucify him. But even though these charges are brought against him, he did not speak up in ways to get him out of harm's way. In fact, he stands before the group silent. If we look at Isaiah 53, I encourage you to go and read this yourself. talks about the fact that Jesus, this is an Old Testament passage, but alluding to Jesus that is to come, and talks about the fact that he was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and familiar with suffering. Like one with whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely it is Jesus who took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows, yet we considered him smitten by God, excuse me, stricken by God, smitten by him, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. Referring to the fact that Jesus is nailed to a cross. He was bruised for our iniquities. And the punishment that brought us peace was upon him. And by his wounds and by his stripes, we are healed. You see, it's Jesus who stands before Pontius Pilate and receives the flogging that in some ways might have killed someone. To be stricken 39 times was the, the allowed law by, a, by a, a piece of leather that had seven different elements on the end with bone and glass and whatever else that was designed to inflict pain and to tear flesh. They wove a, a crown of thorns and placed it upon his head. They spat on him. They cursed him. He was escorted out of the city and placed in a place called Golgotha, the place of the skull to be tortured and to die. They did everything they could to inflict pain on him. They they dislocated his shoulder in order to get his hands and feet nailed to the cross to keep him in place. It also was there to, to make it harder for him to breathe and We all know that it's important to breathe. That's how we live. They were trying to take away his very essence of life. Christ shows us that his exaltation is that of abasement, dishonor, and shame. It's on the cross that Jesus cries out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The earth shakes, and the veil of the temple is is ripped in two. There's this curtain that hangs in the the temple, and it was ripped in two from top to bottom. It is Jesus who dies alone in solitude, alienated from God the Father. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? We find those words in Psalm 22. 
you know, some of those followers, they're dealing with the fact that Jesus has died and they ask for his body and they, they take his body to be placed in a tomb and because it's Friday and the next day is Saturday, which is the Sabbath, they have to do it very quickly and so they put, place him in this tomb. And the Sabbath happens and they show up on Sunday, the first day of the week early. And what do they find? They find the stone has been rolled away. They don't find that there is a body in the tomb any longer. The, tomb, the body they had left was gone. He had been raised from the dead just like he said. He's reminding us that death cannot hold him in the grave. He was raised just like he said. Now, I want to spend a little time in... Sorry, I got, I got crazy there with my, my, my clicker. I want to spend a little time with that phrase, he descended into hell. And the reason I'm going to do that is because the reality is there's no good scripture that deals with that. Can I just tell you that right up front? <laughs> there's no good scripture that really alludes to the fact that Jesus descended into hell. In fact, it's, there's some controversy about that phrase. And, and we don't have time this morning to go through all of that, Okay. So I'm going to try to do a, a little bit into it, give us enough to kind of deal with it. If you want to do more reading, I can point you to more stuff, okay? But one of the things that, that happens in this, this scriptural reference to Jesus descending into hell is referring to, not only referring to the fact that Jesus is placed in a tomb or a grave, but the idea is that God is willing to go wherever is needed even places that we might be faced or forced to go all of us have a choice in terms of where we're going to spend eternity we will either spend eternity with God in heaven or we will spend eternity with God or excuse me we'll spend eternity away from God in hell there's two places that we will end up one of two places we will end up, either in heaven or in hell. It's our choice. But the idea is that Jesus goes where we cannot go ourselves. Or hopefully won't go ourselves. God forsaken places. Uh, the Catholic theologian Hans Urs von Balthasar. Yeah, I think it's a cool name. Um, holds that the descent indicates the depth of Christ's suffering rather than his triumph. Balthazar's approach is governed by the commitment to this patristic principle that, only, quote, only what has been endured by Christ is healed and saved. In other words, we aren't saved unless he does all that is necessary for us to experience his salvation. Now, now we would talk about the fact that Jesus is the blood of Jesus atones for our sins. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin, Okay. So there's this idea that blood has to be, there has to be a sacrifice and a blood sacrifice, and so Jesus becomes the blood sacrifice. But von Al Urs von Balthazar says we, he must endure everything and go the full distance for us to be saved. He's saying that Christ must endure the full consequences of sin and death in order to overcome them. For Jesus Christ to descend into hell is to confess that Jesus descended to the place of punishment in order to experience and overcome the godlessness of hell on our behalf. Yet he overcame and prevailed over death and hell itself. Jesus holds the keys to sin and death into Hades or hell itself. Revelation 1.18 talks about the fact that he says, I hold the keys to death and to Hades. Now, that's not a direct, you know, Jesus descending into hell, but let's be honest. That's pretty cool that he holds the keys. In other words, we, he can lock people out. And for us that are being redeemed, it's really cool to think that we can be locked out. That means we don't get, we don't get sent there. We don't have to endure it. Pretty cool, huh? Anyone getting excited yet? I know I am. He holds the keys to sin, to death, and to hell. Instead of 
receiving the, the penalty of death, which is, the pen, excuse me, the penalty of sin is death, but the gift of God is what? Eternal, Eternal life. That's right, Jack, thank you. In Romans 6.23, you can write this down. I know, I'm, I'm, I'm going really quickly. When we start to proclaim that Jesus ascended into, into to hell, we're also saying and confessing something unique that only truly can be explained through the living Christ. Remember, he, he didn't just die, he was raised again, so he becomes the living Christ, the living God, who died but was not left dead. In fact, there's a number of scriptures that talk about the fact that he, Jesus would not decay. His body would not decay. We don't have time for all of those scriptures. Psalm 16. Okay. But Jesus dies and is raised again. Jesus is not bound by the barriers of sin or death or hell itself. He has overcome the barriers. He goes where sometimes we, being the church, are called to go to the fringes of humanity to share the love of Christ without fear. Sometimes we are called to the fringes of humanity, places that we talk about as being God-forsaken. And right now, we can look at a number of places in our world that are God-forsaken. I'll let you fill in the blanks for some of those places for yourself. But we're reminded that we have, that we can, in the name of Jesus, we can engage the godlessness and suffering of our world with the hope that comes by knowing the one who is not bound but free. We too, as Christians, are called to be free in Christ. There's real power in the person and work of Jesus Christ that brings freedom to all who call on his name. Acts 2.21 tells us, For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And that's really cool. Because we can all experience salvation by calling on his name. By saying, I trust in you. But you know what? He doesn't just want us to stop there. Can I just tell you? He wants more than that. He wants us to be found in him. Because he wants us to be known by him, to see him, and for us to know that he wants to connect with us personally. Because he wants to live in us and through us. Like the little example earlier, he, God wants us to have Jesus be in the driver's seat. Some of us, because we've decided to be in the driver's seat, where are we? What, what road are we on? We might be on the highway to hell. But God wants to, through Jesus Christ, wants to take us on the highway to heaven. But let me tell you this, it's not necessarily a wide path. It's a narrow path. And there are things that he's going to ask us to, to not do. But can I just explain this to you, that when God asks us not to, it's not because he wants to be a killjoy. It's because he wants us to experience more life and life to the full. You know, one of the things I tell our kids here at the preschool, if you follow directions, if you're obedient and follow the directions, you'll have more fun. You know why I say that? That's right. Follow directions, you have more fun. Because nobody wants to be sitting in time out. That's where you're going to spend your time. Is if you're not following directions, you're going to spend time and time out. I don't know about you, but that doesn't seem like real, a lot of fun to me. Especially when your friends are out having fun on the playground. Just saying. So we find this, these words in Psalm 139, 7 and 8. The psalmist says, where can I... Where shall I go from your spirit, or where shall I flee from your presence? If I send, ascend to heaven, you are there. And if I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. And the word Sheol is referring to the place of the dead. I know that's not necessarily referring to Hades here, just to be clear. But the place of the dead does have some connection and correlation a little bit with the idea of Hades as well. But the point is that no matter where we go, we cannot escape where God can go. And he makes it clear that wherever we might go, he was willing to go there in our place. So instead of us receiving the penalty for our sins, which is death, he takes the keys to sin and death and says, I hold them. 
and in me, you can experience life to the full. The hope of Jesus is that in Christ we have the assurance that he's got our back. Nothing is impossible for him, and there is nowhere where he cannot go. I, I, I want you to know that to say, I believe there is, God, there is a God is not enough. I believe there is a God is not enough. He truly understands everything about us, our disappointment with ourselves and suffering of doing what we know is wrong, but do it anyway. The feeling that our sin has caused God to turn his back on us, he understands it all. You see, Jesus' obedience to the Father shows us how far love went so that we can be saved. I love what the psalmist does in Psalm 139 is the fact that God knows us intimately. In fact, he, he knew us as we were being knitted together in our mother's womb. From the very beginning, he knows us. So in Christ, so in Christ, we can have peace with God. In Christ, we can become a new creation. In Christ, we are given life to the full. In, in Christ, we are adopted as his sons and daughters. In Christ, we have freedom. In Christ, we are given the everlasting life. In Christ, we have hope. In Christ, we are known and loved by God. And in Christ, we are more than conquerors. We don't have to live defeated. We can live victorious because he holds the keys to death and to life. The question is, which one do you want? Do you want to choose the God of death or the God of life? Choosing the God of life, he says, not only did I come to give you life, but to give you life to the full. He wants to give us life beyond what we could ask or imagine. But it only happens in him. So what's the big idea? It's this. God gives us Jesus so that we can see him and know him. God isn't just abstract in a lofty place where we can't see or hear him. Because he said, I want you to know that I'm real. I'm going to send my son Jesus so you can believe in me. That he will be a representation of me in, in the world in which you live. That you will experience life just like you do. The joys and the disappointments. The highs and the lows. The loss of friends and loved ones. He's experienced it all. So that you would know how much I love you. And how much I desire to connect with you and to redeem you and bring you peace. The question is for all of us is, so how well do you know him? How well do you know him? Do you see him? The question might be, how well do you see him? You say, because sometimes we're, we're living life as I believe there is a God. I like this idea of Jesus loves me. Yeah, I like that idea. But it's more than that. Because God doesn't just want us to have a little bit of Jesus. He wants us to be all in. He wants us to be all in. So do you know him? Do you see him? He sees you. He has seen you before you even step foot into this world. He knows you from the top of your head to the bottom of your feet. He knows how you're wired. He knows your strengths. He knows your weaknesses. And the fact is, he created you to look a little bit like him because we're made in his image. The problem is that sin tarnishes the image of God. So in order for us to, to get back to what God intended for us, we need Jesus. He is our only hope and he died and rose again to show us his power I want you to know he's coming again 
We don't know when. In fact, the only person that knows when, God is, when Jesus is coming again is God, the Father, himself. So if you ever hear me say Jesus is coming and give you a time or a date, laugh in my face. Because it's not true. The only person that knows is God, the Father himself. But I can tell you this, I think he's coming sooner than later. And we're called to be in relationship with him. This morning, I want to give us a time to respond. And then we're going to take communion as our final time of, of worship. So in these moments, I'm going to ask you that you stand with me right here. Maybe, maybe what you want to do is come and, and pray at the altar. You see, sometimes God wants us to get out of our comfort zone. Jesus got out of his comfort zone and was willing to die. See, he doesn't want us to just be living at a distance. He wants us to be living with him. I don't know where you're at today, but you know where you're at. I'm not asking you to respond to me. I'm asking you to respond to God. Through his son, Jesus Christ, who's calling you into a relationship. And maybe you're in a relationship with God, but you're like, you know what? I want to see him more. I want to know him more. And I'm going to commit to knowing him more and seeing him more. And maybe that's what you need to pray today. I encourage you to come. God, in these moments, may we respond to you and make room for you in our hearts. It's in your name we pray. I encourage you to come. I'd love to pray with you this morning. God, right now we just pray that we would make the right choice, that you would help us to see you and to know you. May we see you and be known by you in new and fresh ways. We pray this in your name. Maybe seated.
going to take communion here in just a moment. We're going to continue to let those that want to continue to pray. Just know this is still open for you. Communion is open to anyone. Anyone that says Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. If you don't feel comfortable in taking the elements today, just pass them to your neighbor. It's fine. You don't have to be a member of this church or anything. You just say that Jesus is my Lord and my Savior. And maybe you don't know him right now, but I can tell you right now, even in these moments, even as Caleb and Amber are going to play here and sing, he's asking us to make room. You can respond in these moments so that when you take those elements, we're reminded that Jesus dies, his body's broken for us. And as we drink of the cup, we're reminded that his blood is spilled so that our sins are covered. We're going to come and offer you the elements. Just hold the elements until we're done, and then we'll, uh, we'll take the elements together. And I will make room for you. where I lay it down every burden every crown this is my surrender this is my surrender here is where I lay it down every lie and every vow this is my surrender Shake up the ground of all my tradition. Break down the walls of all my religion. Your way is better. Oh, your way is better. Shake up the ground of all my tradition. Break down the walls of all my religion. Your way is better. Oh, your way is better. Shake up the ground of all my tradition. Break down the walls of all my religion. Your way is better. Your way is better. And I will make room for you. To do whatever you want to. To do whatever you want to. the night that Christ was to be betrayed. He was with his disciples and he took the bread and he broke it as they went at every Passover meal. And he says, this is going to represent something new. It's going to represent my body which will be broken for you. Every time you eat of the bread, remember me and be thankful. And in the same way he took the cup blessed it. And the cup reminded them of the, of the Passover where they put the blood of the lamb on the doorposts of their homes. 
and anywhere that the blood of the lamb was applied, the death angel would pass over. And death would not come to that home. He said, I'm going to represent the Passover. Anywhere that my blood is applied, instead of receiving death, the death angel will pass over. Every time you drink of the cup, remember me and be thankful. God, we thank you for the blood of Jesus applied to each one of us. May we come to know you more and more. For we pray these things in the name of Jesus, who is our hope. It's in his name we pray. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. In his name go, for he loves you and comes to redeem you. Trust in him as you go. You are dismissed.